Hey everyone and welcome to the third installment in this VeloWave e-bike series. In the first video, I had unboxed and assembled the bike doing the initial setup and test of the unit. The second video had ergonomic and tracking upgrades as well as a test drive. I'd used a seat pad to help out with the rear suspension, but this is a rigid frame in the rear and there is no shock absorption on this seat post. Also, in the last video, I spoke about how I wanted to upgrade the tires for a myriad of reasons. So in this video, I've bought all the supplies that I'm going to use to do these upgrades. So we're going to jump right into this. I also have a couple of extra things that I purchased that we'll be bolting on and testing out along the way. So let's get started. I'm removing the seat post first. I want to do this as a separate project before the tires to see the difference. And the first thing I'm doing is I'm taking a measurement of the inner diameter of the tube. I just as well could have taken a measurement of the seat post diameter. And I've got 31.6 millimeters. Then I took a measurement of the length of the tube and it turned out to be 350 millimeters. With that in mind, I picked up the 31.6 by 350 seat post from Suntour directly. There's a sale going on there, cost significantly less than it would from Amazon. Also happened to get free shipping with this and $10 off as a first time customer. Because I sit around 230 pounds, I also got the red spring, which would be the correct spring for my weight. I will be evaluating it with the medium spring though, just to see how it works. Let's do a quick unboxing of the seat post. I've got the seat post, heavy spring, and the instructions. I'll remove the seat from the old seat post, starting with this cushion. I don't know if I'm gonna need the cushion once this job is done. We'll see what happens. But as for now, it's coming off to remove the seat. Yeah, I don't know, we'll find out. I borrowed this light from my wife's other bike. I'm gonna return this to her now as I'm not gonna need it anymore with the new setup. A single bolt loosens this seat from the old post. And we're disconnected. I'm installing the post into the bicycle right now just to hold it in place to mount the seat, nothing more. So I'm locking it down. And there's two clamps here with a hex key on each side that I'm going to have to loosen. Just enough to be able to snap the seat in place. So I lower it down on the rails and one is just not enough so I loosen a little more. It snaps right in. It still allows for forward and back adjustment as well as pitch. So I break out a level because I just want to have it level right now just to see where we are. Once it's level I tighten it down when I have my forward and back direction where I want it. And then I'll lock down the other side. And this is torqued to between 15 and 18 newton meters. This has still got the original spring on the original preload and I could compress this all the way with little effort. So I'm going to put preload on this spring before I test it because I don't want to break this thing when I sit on it. So I'm going to remove it. And I'm going to turn this in in the plus direction to increase the preload for testing and then dial back as needed. I'm not going to be going with the spring most likely but we're just going to do it for testing. That was several turns in. That is an overabundance of preload, but we'll see what we got. I put together a special temporary mount to record the reaction of the seat mount as I try different springs and preload settings. At this point, as I sit on the seat, it looks like it drops about a third. So from that point of view, it's good. But between the preload and now me sitting on the seat, there's so much compression on the spring. It really does little else. I don't see too much oscillation from pedaling, which is good, so it's not too loose. The problem is, is everything is so rigid now. This is the wrong spring, and I realize that, so I don't really have a problem. We can see that it does absorb the larger bumps, but as for anything smaller, it's really doing nothing because the spring is really at its end. There's a larger bump. I'm gonna dial it back a little because I think it's safe to do so. And this thing started at like a centimeter. It's almost an inch in. So I'm gonna split the difference between now and its original position. Just a couple turns. And when I sit on the seat right here, you could see that it is like two thirds down right there. Now I'm sitting, it is like almost fully compressed now. And we can see the spring obviously is not gonna respond the way we want to. It's almost fully compressed with just me sitting on it. And mind you, this is really, much more uh, preload than they would call for. This is just me dialing back the extreme amount of preload I put on it. Every time I pedal, we could see it oscillate. So this would not be an ideal setting either. I just wanted to illustrate this before I went and put the correct spring in and capture this on video. So I'm gonna loosen the bottom adjuster entirely. The 
The medium spring will slide right out the bottom along with its nylon bushing. I'll swap that bushing onto the red spring. We'll note that this spring has some sort of dampener or centering rubber thing in the middle and the new spring does not. Obviously if they designed it like that they would have put it on the new spring. So I'm just going to slide the new spring in now and then we're going to take the adjuster, put it back in and I'm going to dial it in to just over a centimeter. This is the absolute minimum that they allowed and it most likely won't be enough, but I'm going to start from here just like a turn or so over there we go. Perfect. Yeah, this is essentially zero preload and almost full compression as we see here. So this is definitely not enough. So I'm going to start adjusting upward. I added one more turn. Things are looking really close now. It needs to be tightened up a bit more, especially you see here on this big bump, it almost bottoms all the way out. It does look good when I go over this grass patch, this dirt patch. It's able to absorb a lot of shock, but still a bit loose. We're just going to tighten it up maybe half a turn, and I think we're there. And you can see at this point the oscillations caused by pedaling are almost completely gone. So this is almost perfectly set up. Maybe at this point now just a quarter turn of extra preload might be all it needs. But this is all I'm going to show in the film. I'm not going to nitpick. But a couple bumps and bad ones, they didn't ground out anymore. But just, yeah, this is uh, more than I would ever expect normally on the trail. So I think we're really set up good. And the seat really worked well to absorb the shock. So I'm really happy with this setup. We're going to move on to the next thing now. This is my alarm slash rear light slash stoplight. Let's unbox it. Documentation, mounting supplies, the light slash alarm, and the remote control. Instructions say it needs to be fully charged before we continue. So we're going to plug this thing right in and let it start charging as we put the mount on the back of the bike. The lamp glows dimly to indicate that it's charging. I'm going to try their under seat mount. They have some silicon isolation that you install on it. This is then placed on the rails just under the back of the seat. The cable tie is supposed to go around and through this. Not very elegant, but I guess that's how it's supposed to be. I'll probably switch to a metal cable tie. There's a handlebar mount for the remote that I mounted for testing. I probably won't use it, but this is what it looks like. Fully charged, the light goes out. I make sure that USB port covers closed, keep dirt out. And it snaps right in the back here. That's it. Now I said I was thinking about replacing these tires and I've had 88 miles to think about it and I definitely came to the decision that I wanted road tires. These are 650, 58B or 27.5 by 2.35. I've got my replacement tires here and these are Nimbus 2 Armadillo Reflect 650B by 2.3, slightly thinner. No acrobatics in this swap out. I'm just using a container with a doormat I'm going to use a quick release here to get this tire off of the forks and I'm just going to prop it up on that doormat just to secure it because it bites into it. I don't have to worry about the bike uh, rotating and falling. That's all that does. It's supported on the wheel, the kickstand, and that front right fork. It's not on the brake at all. So everything here is just fine to work on the wheel. Putting a piece of tape here because the indicator for the direction on the rotor is absolutely microscopic. Guaranteed to get this backwards so I'm making an arrow of my own. There it is right there, zoomed in 5,000 times. There's my arrow. For those who have ever emptied air from a motorcycle or bike tire, you could smell this portion of the video right here. I've zoomed it up 800% so we don't have to wait on it. Yeah, that smells like something. I found these tire levers made in America and I bought them because they were made in America. I, I don't see a whole lot of stuff made in America, but here they are and it's called b50strong.com. I, I don't plug for companies, but how often do you see this? So there you are. This tire and rim is like brand new. So it was nothing just to squeeze it to detach it from the rim. It's not like it was like annealed on or glued on or anything like that. So popping in the tire levers was easy too. It was no chore at all. Pop it in the first and then the second one just run around the tire to get that beat out from the rim. Pretty much standard fare. There's no difference between this and a regular bike. Do the other side and pull the whole tube and the tire right out of that rim. I have a carpet on the floor to protect this rim. It's not sitting on a concrete floor, nothing like that. And I'll save these tires and tubes in case this ever goes back to being a dirt bike. There's nothing wrong with these. 
checking my rim strip now, hoping it's good because I don't have any extra and that would mean another run to the store, but it was good. I'm using new tubes. These are from Giant, 27.5. So now I'll fill that new tube up with air just enough to hold form. I won't be needing this label anymore, so I remove it. And I managed to find the microscopic rotation arrow on the tire. So now I'll put the piece of tape on and put an arrow that I could see without a microscope. Notice as I insert the inner tube how perfectly I center the charade valve in the middle of the logo, because I'll be bound to screw this up during the installation onto the rim. There we go. This was actually unintentional, but some people consider this an insult in the biking community. Now start working one side at a time, getting the bead of the tire inside of the rim, making sure that the tube is inside the rim, that I'm not pinching the tube in any way. Once one side is fully completed, I'll go and flip the wheel around and work the other side. As I approach the end, it'll start to get tighter. And I'll need to use the tire levers to finish off getting the bead in. which leads to the snap of success. Now I'll do a quick walk around, make sure that everything is seated okay, and verify that both of the arrows that I drew are both pointed in the anti-clockwise direction, which they are. The tie will then be given just enough air to provide some rigidity for inspection. As air is added, the tire will be looked over. Make sure that the bead where it seals on the rim is even all around the tire. If not, air would be removed so that the tire could be fixed. This is checked on both sides of the tire to make sure everything looks good. Each time it looks good, more air will be added. My front tire will be finished off with around 45 pounds on the dustiest bike pump in existence. Cap it off. Remove the tape. Now I'm gonna lift the bike up and kick the container out of the way. I roll the wheel up to align the disc right between the brake pads and then lower down the forks onto the two screws where the quick release is. And there we go, back together. Last order of business, just lock down my quick release. The easy tire is done. Now we'll move on to the rear wheel where the tire change process is about the same, but the wheel removal process is much different. Because I plan on flipping the bike over for this, I was removing the battery to reduce the weight, and I'm using the key and that little tab. And I'm having problems with the tab here, wondering why it's not working, that little switch that makes the battery fall out. And as I'm turning it, it's just sort of loosely flapping. I didn't realize, but we could see here that it's actually disintegrating and falling apart into several pieces. And I see that now in the video. As I'm pulling out these separate pieces that make up that tab, and there we go, it just dissolved on the second use of that tab, it's broken. I'm going to contact VeloWave about that. But I'm going to end up using a pair of needle nose pliers to remove the battery. The battery removal conducted by Black & Decker. I have two laundry baskets upside down with some towels on them. And this allowed me to support the handlebars without damaging anything as I propped up the bike upside down. Again, battery removed, so it's lighter. Also sits on the seat and now we have access to the rear tire. I'll now need to remove a couple of cable ties that hold these cables to the frame. Here's one. I lifted up, I actually found some packing material under here, so I removed that. And I'm gonna disconnect the motor power. There it is. The second cable tie is directly behind it. Snap that one off now. Pull it out. Now I could slide the dust cap up and out of the way of the nut. We see the nut over here. Bend this cable straight, make it a little easier to work with. Just like that. The dust cap on the other side of the wheel pops right off. Using an 18 millimeter, I'll loosen the nut. They're not really on that tight. Then I'll do the same thing on the other side.
There's a hex bolt here that holds on the bracket. I only videotaped the loosening of the bolt, but not its complete removal, but it's supposed to be completely removed. Give a quick check here, make sure nothing's binding and a gentle lift to make sure it's lifting. And then finally, I will lift the wheel out from the bike only to grab the derailleur to lift it back and pull the chain out of the way. And the tire and wheel is now released from the bike. This part of the process is exactly the same as the front tire, so I'm not going to go and repeat everything. It's just a bit heavier to work with because of the motor. Placing it back on is the opposite of reverse. As we have to get that cassette through the chain, I pull back the derailleur to get the cassette in. And I got to get that wire for the motor in as well. And now we sort of get it back down on those two tracks for the axle. And once it seats in, I let go of the derailleur. Give everything a gentle test spin and we're in. Now it's just a matter of bolting these nuts back in. This screw also goes back in. And finally, these nuts are snug down. There are arrows that match up on both sides of this plug to plug this cable back in without breaking it. And then it slides right in. The dust cap is then lowered back into position on this side. And then on this side. These two cables are then re-cable tied back down to this stanchion. Followed by the next stanchion, I had inadvertently forgot the shift cable, as we see. I will go and fix that later. That's it. That's the back tire done. Both tires are done now, but before I get it on the road, I'm going to have to go and straighten out the derailleur. Now I can easily sling a toe strap over the garage door rail and just hook it right up to the bike to raise the rear of this bike up into the air to allow me to adjust the derailleur in the garage. That would be just fine, sufficient if I were doing this once in a while. However, as I started this whole process from the garage and setting the gears and then going and turning stuff, everything's wiggling around. It, I just couldn't make this video. So I decided I was going to bring this inside and put this on the bike lift to stabilize everything for the camera. On the way in, I could hear a noise coming from the front wheel, sounded like the brakes, and I checked them, and three out of four of the screws holding the brakes in were loose. This is not unreasonable for a new bike. I'm looking at the back one now, and I've loosened this more than it was, obviously, to make sure that they deflect a lot. As a matter of fact, I'm going to loosen the back one a little bit more on this screw to ensure that I get deflection when I move them back and forth. Because what I want to do to center them is I'm going to go and I'm going to pull the brakes nice and tight to center them. We can see that they move to center as I pull them, and I'm going to hold them there. And while they're held in place tight, I'm going to tighten down both screws progressively, one and the other, and then the other's tight, and I'm going to move back to the top and tighten on top one. Just hand tighten, not too tight, screwing into aluminum. And now that brake is perfectly centered. Moving on to the front now, same thing, I've pre-loosened it. I'm going to hold them tight as they're centered and tighten it down. Again, not too tight, going into aluminum, don't want to strip it out, just snug it down nice. And then the other one. And then back up to the top. And that's it for the brakes. As I move the camera back and forth, you could see the tiny gap between these two arrows right here, showing the brakes perfectly centered. And then when I press on the brakes, you could see the gap disappear and then reappear as I let go. Because I've done a lot of tightening and off-camera adjusting in the last 80 miles, I feel as though this derailleur should be completely redone from the beginning, not just adjusted, but the whole cable tension and everything. In earlier attempts, the low gear setting didn't bottom down into the position where I wanted the screw to in the derailleur. It seemed like there was a problem, so I just want to start the cable anew. And we're going to do this by bringing it all the way into the top gear on seventh gear, and that's where we're going to begin. And I'm using a 9mm to loosen the bolt that holds that cable into position. And then turning the index as far as it will go in the clockwise position. And this will set everything back to zero. 
Now with the index all the way at zero and this cable here removed, this high screw setting is the only thing that could influence the chain in that position. The noise gets quiet as I dial it in. At this point, the noise from the misalignment is completely gone. I could also verify visually between the two sprockets. With the low setting done, the cable can now be reintroduced and tightened. The witness mark showed the cable is several millimeters off from the factory position. I just clicked it into 6th and it did not move as expected. I will now have to turn the index anti-clockwise a number of turns. Eventually making its way into 6th gear, I do want to give it a little bit more of a turn, make sure there's not any noise. Also give a visual inspection and make sure that both sprockets are lined up. This sounds quiet now and everything lines up visually, so now we're going to run through all the gears. With a final visual inspection of the alignment in fifth gear, everything seems good. We got one more item to cover. We're going to make our way now to first gear to set up our low limit screw, the last setting. Previously, if that screw bottomed out in the mechanism in any way, it would misalign the chain, which it shouldn't do because the screw shouldn't just float. But now as I run it, and I push a little, push against it, I see that it makes a little bit of noise so I could benefit, right, we see that. I could benefit from giving the screw just a little bit of turn. That way there'll be at least some pressure push against that screw and it won't be just floating there anymore, not pushing against anything. And we can see with the gentlest pressure applied to the derailleur, it goes just a little bit further than I would want it to. And I could use that screw to dial back that limit, which I'm gonna do now. And we can now see that screw does actually touch the mechanism. And it's just going to be just pushing ever so slightly to bring that back into alignment when I push it. Now we can see with the lightest of pressure, the sprockets line up, but it doesn't go past it anymore. And that's what I want. So we're just going to review the gears one more time. And everything sounds really good. This is all perfectly set up now. So I'm happy with it. And I definitely benefited from loosening that cable and starting from scratch and trying not to adjust from the cable tension that was provided from the factory. So that's the way to do it, and it should run a lot better now. In a matter of about 20 miles, a really loud creaking started to appear on this lower end. Initially thinking it was the pedals, I checked these pedals here and had replaced it with some specialized ones that my wife had. And sure enough, these did have some give in them. Right? There's some play in these pedals already that came with the bike, and I swapped them out, and I'm not going to worry about these. These are gone. One is worse than the other. But these were not primarily the cause, because these new pedals don't have any play, and I took it for another test drive, and that creek is still there, and always in one position. So when I grab this crank now, you could see the deflection on this thing. Look how much it's oscillating. I'll move in closer. And you can see how the whole thing is moving back and forth. And if we look from the other side, we can really see it. This thing is really loose. And I contacted VeloWave and they said, yeah, it was probably installed wrong and needs to be tightened. So we're going to remove this. We have to disassemble this whole lower assembly. So we're going to take out this hex bolt. And that same bolt is obviously also removed from the other side. A 
crank extractor tool is needed for this purpose. It can be picked up pretty cheap on Amazon. And this one comes with the tool to press out the cranks. And it also comes with the tool to tighten the bottom bracket. So I'm going to get this set up. And I'm going to screw it in all the way and secure it first into the crank. Now I'm just going to tighten down the slack of this press until it's at full seat. And then I'm going to stop. It's important never to use the crank as support when trying to pull this off. No good will come of it. Instead, the supplied wrench should be used as support in conjunction with the 16 mil. If you hold on to the crank, you're going to be working against the crank that you're trying to be pushing out. At some point, it'll press the crank off, and then this portion can be turned out, followed by the entire tool and the crank assembly. On this side, I'm going to have to snap off the cadence sensor to access the lug. I'll just move that out of the way. And the same exact process will be repeated on this side. There's much less area to hold on to that tool, though. Given that there's a big gear over here, you may want to use your own spanner for this. But this all comes right off. It's the same type of fitting as the other side, and both are loose. VeloWave didn't have a torque specification. They said to just tighten it, which explains why it loosened in the first place. So I am using Shimano's method of between 25 and 35, which is 30. You can see that these are just like hand loosened, no problem. So I'm just going to torque it down to 30 foot pounds each side. If that doesn't hold, I'll come back and do this again at 35. But we're going to settle on 30. So there we go. Same process repeated for the other side, 30 foot pounds. At this point, there's no noticeable wiggle, so things are looking good. I'll now reattach the cadence sensor, slipping it back over the shaft, and you have to align it where it came off because it is keyed. And once you align it, it's just pushed in, it's a snap fit. And that's it. This is a press fit, and I don't want any galling. It looks like there was some galling. So I'm going to make sure that the shaft is cleaned up as well as the inside here. I don't want any debris being pushed against these mating surfaces. And then a very, very, very light coat of lithium grease will be applied to the shaft. I'm going to match a crank up to the previous surface that was used before and just lay it there. Inserting the screw back in, finger tighten as far as this will go. And then eventually tightening this all the way down to get the crank back into full seat. And there is resistance, obviously, as it tightens down. And the resistance will come to a, a dead stop, like can't turn anymore. And that's where I don't go any further. I give it a spin. The crank feels good. There's no slop. Give it a little turn, pull in every direction, and I don't feel any deflection in any direction. So things are looking okay. Repeating the same process on the other side, I put the chain on. I didn't have to put the chain on. And the second go around, I actually don't put the chain on. Obviously, the pedals need to be 180 degrees out of phase from each other. The bicycle is not going to operate very well. So I rotate the other one 180 degrees out of phase because that's easier and then seat this one into position on the flat. Again, this is foolish. The chain could go on after this is completed. Either way, I put that nut back in and finger tighten it all the way into position. And then we'll press everything in with that nut by tightening it down until we reach that positive stop that tells us that we've reached the end. I then removed the chain to conduct my test, as you see here. I'm grabbing from both sides, deflecting it, spinning it, making sure everything looks good, and everything does look good. So the issue has been solved. I'll now put the chain back on. The chain will just go over the pedal, and then pushing the derailleur forward on the bottom will give it more slack to allow it to clear this sprocket, wrapping around the sprocket, and then letting go of the derailleur once completed to bring tension back upon the chain. I test it out and everything's working fine. This project is finished. We'll take a few minutes to look at my multifunction tail light. And this third button right here sets one of the four options. And that's blinking. And then we got this pulsing. 
we have this strobe flashing, and then we have this constant on. The fifth time shuts it off, and it's got an inertia that makes it shine brighter when you actually break in. However, there are other functions we're going to have to take outside to show. Demonstrating the world's worst bicycle bell, this bottom button, I'm reducing the volume in this video by, like, 50 decibels. And I'm going to put it into settings mode. We could hear all four options, one worse than the next. And I, I really don't know what to call them. They're all terrible. And they're so loud that they would just scare the crap out of anybody on the road. I would never use this as a bicycle bell. I just couldn't imagine it. I consider this is pointed downward. If I point this upward at myself, it would just pierce my ears, leave them ringing more so than they are. Loud and obnoxious makes it great for an alarm, which I'll now arm. And that tells me it's armed. And if I just touch it once, now I just get a warning. And if I do that within 15 seconds, then it goes off. And that is loud. And I hit the wrong button, and this disarms it. Great alarm, great backup light, terrible bicycle bell. My new battery switch from VelaWave has arrived, so we're going to open it up and have a look. And as I unpacked, I realized it's a little heavier, and sure enough, it looks like it's cast aluminum or something. It's not plastic anymore, so I guess they knew they had a problem with it, because they're no longer plastic. So I'm just going to install that right where the old one was. Funny thing is, they used the mold for the old one that was made of plastic, so it's unnecessarily wide. Like, it's very heavy. It doesn't need to be that big, I don't think. And that's going to be the last repair, so now I'm going to install the battery. And call this complete. Very nice. And that concludes this video on this VelaWave E-Bike Ghost upgrade, repair, and adjustment. I hope you found this video enjoyable, entertaining, and informative. Do me a favor, hit that like button down below. Helps me out a lot when you do. And hit that subscribe button for more videos like this when they come out. If another video comes out like this in the series, a link will be posted in the top right corner. Again, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Would you like to reply? <laughs>